uh, hello everyone and welcome to a new session for our 50 plus shades of gothic conference and we are having now our first panel for the children's and young adult gothic stuff section and first of all thank you to our public for joining us and thank you to our panelists for sharing their work with us today and i'll begin by reminding those in the public to keep their microphones and cameras off uh, during the presentations, and we will have the Q&A session at the end after the three speakers have shared their work, so we can ask all of them questions at the same time and maybe have some discussion together. And this will be reminded later, but to ask a question, please, you can use the, the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, or you can type your question in the chat if you feel like you don't want to share your face with us since this is being recorded and will be uploaded to your YouTube channel. So I will introduce our first speaker today, who is Javier Torres Fernandez, and he's sharing today with us his work entitled The Story of Coralines, a Gothic Coming of Age. Javier Torres Fernandez is a research intern and he is currently finishing an MA in English Studies at the University of Almería. And his research interests are focused on queer studies, contemporary literature, and popular culture. So, Javier? Thank you very much. Just a second, let me share the presentation. And, okay. So, first, thank you so much, Laura, for your introduction. And also, thanks to the organizing committee of the 50 plus Shades of Coffee for organizing the conference series and giving me this opportunity. Without further ado, I'll just let's begin. My presentation deals with Coralines from Bainail Gaiman, published in 2002, and also the stop motion movie released in 2009, directed by Henry Selig. Now, while Gothic stories often emphasize and question human morality, uh, children's literature usually holds a uh, moralizing value. Gaiman's Caroline presents a story that belongs to the genre of children's literature and which is deeply rooted in the Gothic tradition. Some Gothic elements that can be found are, for example, ghosts, grotesque beings, and the existence of the other world as a dark parallel universe that sets the story for Caroline's adventure. In both cases, Caroline has to deal with anxieties related with personal development growing up and the world that surrounds her. Well, um, according to Buckley, uh, the uncanny is seen as one of the most useful theoretical tools for understanding children's fiction and following Rowling and West, childhood itself can be uncanny. In addition, Caroline has achieved canonical status since it is a rich work that explores darker sides of life and it aims at negotiating one's place in the world. In addition, Caroline's emotional development is essential for this story since, since it addresses specific fears of childhood, such as loneliness, not fitting in, and also highlights the limitations that are put on children, uh, creativity, and also their freedom to explore. Now, from the very beginning, we know that Caroline has a great adventurous nature. Also, from the very start, Caroline is left to her own devices to deal with conflicts and confront trauma in a true Gothic fashion. Despite some may consider that Coraline is uh, inappropriate for children because of its very Gothic nature, the Gothic elements actually contribute to the awakening of young readers by undermining the idealization of uh, family law, for example. Remember that everyone around Coraline seems to be um, ignoring her. In the end, these Gothic elements serve a significant didactic purpose, and these, far from ruining the book, uh, contribute to the creation of the environment that is much needed for the making of this didactic purpose. Um, now, just before delving into a specific elements, uh, there is a tendency in the Gothic to subvert conversional aspects of morality, and justice is often served when evil forces are defeated, which, spoiler alert, it happens in both the movie and the book. Now, while Gaiman's book has been catalogued as children's literature and is, has been defined as frightening and gothic in essence, Selig's movie adaptation successfully captures, explores, and also projects the book's gothic essence onto the screen. As we can see in these examples, the difference in color between the real world and the other world is definitely clear. The other world is idealized, a world in which Caroline 
will find almost everything that she wish she wishes sorry in her first visit to the other world she will be received with a wonderful homemade meal cooked by her other mother which is a contrast with the food that she actually is used to eat back in the real world as we can read it was the best chicken that Caroline had ever eaten her mother sometimes made chicken but it was always out of packets or frozen and it was very dry and it never tasted of anything However, um, here we can find the first main difference between movie Coraline and book Coraline. In the movie, Coraline is astonished and amazed by the other world, but in the book, she grows suspicious from the other world from the very beginning. And for example, she is not naive enough to see the other world as her, uh, the other mother as her real mother. And we can see this in this description. A woman stood in the kitchen with her back to Coraline. She looked a little like Coraline's mother, only her skin was white as paper, only her, she was taller and thinner, only her fingers were too long and never stopped moving, and her dark red fingernails were curved and sharp. Another big difference in terms of the narration of the story is that Selig's adaptation includes an opening scene which is actually set in what seems to be the Bell Dam's workshop in, you know, she is actually making this stuffed doll that resembles Coraline and actually will be spying for the Bell Dam in Coraline's real world. On the other hand, however, Gaiman's Coraline begins with the discovery of the door and a description of the house. Both openings include Gothic elements, but the book introduces Coraline's nature as an explorer in her house. And a uh, comparison between the two it's, is actually inevitable. Like while book Coraline is one that seems to be more mature, polite and smarter, movie Coraline is presented as more naive. In addition, despite the movie is not failing at delivering frightening and scary sequences, the atmosphere in the book is much creepier thanks to Gaiman's description and Coraline's inner monologue that actually leaves room for imagination in the readers. Also, fundamental and essential in our understanding of Coraline's uh, coming of age is the fact that movie Coraline has Y-born, YB, with her, while book Coraline is completely alone in her adventure. He brings humor and also eases the tension of the Gothic atmosphere and also substitutes uh, the inner monologue in the book. As we know, uh, in the book, Coraline's thoughts are in our head and we read and experience things through her eyes. Now in the movie, given the fact that it's a visual medium, um, this inner monologue is uh, communicated through her having her talking to Wyborn or YB, for example. As I have just said, uh, book Coraline is completely alone and there are no other children around and adults seem to not pay her enough attention or to her concerns when her parents have gone missing. In the other hand, um, book uh, on the other world, YB helps her to have uh, fun, but also snaps her out of her fantasy because he warns Coraline about the true nature of the other world and the other mother. And I would say that other YB makes the other world funnier at the beginning for Coraline because she has someone to share the experience with and it makes the other world more appealing. However, he is also essential in showing that not everything is as it seems and even he saves Coraline from the mirror prison. He constitutes a support, an active support on Coraline's side in the other world. And I would say that even though the book may seem creepier, the decision to make a more chillful set and have goofy characters such as YB makes the movie more appealing for viewers and it makes it also less lonely. Um, more subtle differences between book and movie include, for example, um, how the hand of the Beldam is described or presented. While the movie presents a metallic hand that actually goes along with the stuffed dolls theme introduced at the opening scene, uh, the book describes a hand of flesh and bone, a five-footed crimson nailed the color of bone, that clicked and scuttled. In addition, the door and the corridor through which Coraline enters the other world is also different. In the movie, um, there is a little door in, a, in the living room and the corridor is at first presented as something colorful that fades into a cluttered space. 
uh, obviously as the story progresses. Now, on the other hand, in the book, the corridor from the very beginning is a dark hallway behind a huge wooden door. One of the times in which Caroline is going through the corridor, we can read the following. She knew that if she fell in that corridor, she might never get up again. Whatever that corridor was, was older by far than the other mother. It was deep and slow, and it knew that she was there. This brings another evil being into the story, but it's not explored neither in the movie or the book. However, it can be argued that the corridor's change in nature is used as a device to let us know how scared Caroline is when she goes back and forth. Another thing to mention would be the lack of adults. Movie Caroline has people supporting her apart from YB. Her parents do not go missing until a few days after she has visited the other world. And when they have gone missing, there are still some neighbors around that will help her for a bit. On the other hand, in the book, Caroline's parents disappear right after her first visit. And as we have mentioned, there is no YB in the book. Moreover, in the book, the actresses are out of town, so there is actually no one around to help her. She has to do it all for herself, go shopping with her money, and it's interesting enough to see how separated the adult world is from the children world. When Caroline calls the police to tell them that her parents have been kidnapped, the officer does not believe her and actually tells her to take some hot chocolate and go back to sleep. Again, book Caroline is completely alone and she receives no help whatsoever. Uh, actually, to conclude this presentation, I would like to stop and observe how the ending of the book is changed in the movie and what this means for her coming of age. While movie Caroline is not aware that the Beldam's hand has escaped into the real world just after coming back, book Caroline is wiser and she already knows this, so she bravely plans on how to trap it and by doing so, this ending reflects her character development in a better way in terms of self-confidence and maturity. Moreover, I, would, I think that movie Coraline get, gets help from YB and without him, she might not even have been able to defeat the Beldam's hands. The consequence is that, for example, movie Coraline's personality makes the ending more rewarding because a clear development in her is actually seen, not only because she eventually gets along with YB, but also because she is clearly more mature than the Coraline that is presented to us at the beginning of the movie. Despite this, I would argue that the book portrays Caroline as braver, trickier, and wiser, and she's even able to wait patiently for a good chance to trap the Beldam's hand, or knowing that it's around without losing her mind. Gaiman's uh, descriptions in general delivers a creepier and more gothic story, and I think it's fair to state that in both cases, Caroline's contact with a gothic reality has, has made their, her understand the value of her family, her neighbors, and the you know growing up so this was it thank you so much for your attention um this is also the work site you know i will be glad to answer any questions later on in the discussion section thank you thank you very much javier for that very interesting presentation and comparison between the novel and the film Thanks. Um, so we're going to move on to our next presenter, who is Carmen Sofia Diaz Sanchez. Uh, she is a PhD student in the Literary Studies Program at Complutense University of Madrid, and her research focuses on the different adaptations of Gothic genre fiction, such as comics, cinema, and TV series, and on the translations from English into Spanish of British Victorian female authors of the Gothic genre. And she's going to present today her work entitled Coming of Age, Experiences and the Creation of Gothic Worlds in Tim Burton's Work. Please. Thank you, Laura, for your introduction and the committee for having me here. Let me share my presentation. So today I will explore which is the role of the Gothic elements in the adaptations of children and young adults fiction, and specifically when portraying the common of age experiences of the protagonist in different stages of life. In doing so, I chose Tim Burton, a worldwide famous filmmaker with a very distinctive style and three of his films as examples. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, and Alice in Wonderland. 
Before moving on the analysis, it is necessary to bear in mind a few ideas. The adaptations of children's fiction, gothic fiction, into a film have been conditioned not only by how the movie industry works, but also by the evolution of three elements. The gothic genre itself, the concept, the concept of childhood, and the role of children in gothic fiction, both in all as audience and as characters. As there's an ongoing discussion about the appropriateness of the gothic elements for children, which explains why Barton's gothic films for children have at least a PG-7 rate. And the, and the varying role of children as characters as they went from witnessing the supernatural to be the supernatural themselves. Due to time limitations, I'm only going to explain the most significant strategies Barton uses in his filmography with regards on this topic and in connection to the selected films and children's gothic fiction. He creates a whole universe where two ontological realities coexist, and so the actions taken in one realm affects the other. So there's a real world, which has some resemblance with our own, is where the protagonists live alienated, either physically or psychologically, and is marked by a lack of vividness. And the other world, when the supernatural lives under its own rules. He makes the differences between these two worlds so obvious that the audience, especially children, can identify each of them at a glance and follow the plot without much trouble. Moreover, the protagonist's struggle in the real world is what triggers their fall into the other world. Thanks to a certain object, object or place, like the Golden Chicken for Charlie's film, the time loop uh, cave in Miss Peregrine's or the rubbish hole in Alice. And so they start a double journey. Firstly, an advertent journey. Like quest in fantasy and fairy tales, the protagonist has to complete a task in the other world one that only them can accomplish to restore the balance, save the other world and their inhabitants. Secondly, a journey of self-discovery towards maturity, a one in which they assert in their own personality and gain the necessary knowledge to solve their problems back in the real world. What is happening here is that both the protagonist and the other world along with its inhabitants are complementing each other, as both have something that makes them unique but does not exist in the other realm, so when they interact, they can't help each other to overcome the problems. Depending on how Barton uses certain colors and aesthetic elements, they represent one world or the other. Also, it goes hand in hand with the plot as it makes more visible the personality of the characters and the personal changes they are experiencing. Regarding the color use, he distinguished between a vibrant colorful world and a dark and quirky one as he uses colors according to the message he was to convey. When the characters are real life people, they are very thin or skinny, have pale skin and dark and the right circles, resembling a corpse or a ghost. They wear vintage clothes, sometimes with extravagant designs, but something that reminds of a previous era with a Victorian hint. And the buildings share that Londonier Victorian vibe, either in an urban setting or in the middle of nowhere, the buildings are high, narrow, dark, have sharp contours, and a decadent halo. Usually there are trees of a various nearby, and this forest is full of trees with long fingered branches located in a gloomy or foggy landscape. Regarding the use of motifs and themes, I'm only going to focus on the most frequent ones. Usually the protagonists are the eternal outcast, which explains the use of motifs such as the other, the feeling of loneliness of the protects. Losing something precious to them, like their family or home, are the most typical examples. There are two themes connected to this one. The character's origin as this theme of learning new information about the true past of their family, especially their parents, in relation to their own origin as an essential part of the character's identity and moral development. And the other theme is trauma. Because they are unable to cope with it, as nightmares and flashes of forgotten memories haunt them. And part of the coming of age experiences is to learn new means to overcome the trauma. The past of the characters will play a part in their future because, it, because it's what they do it got matters because no one is born good or evil. Linked to these concepts are the, sub, are the sub themes of math scientists or creators because every creation, artifact or knowledge is good or bad depending on how you use it. And without further ado, how the Gothic elements are included in Charlie and Chocolate Factory. About the landscape of the architecture, there are two spaces. Charlie's real world has the Badura and Londonier Victorian vibe, more like an industrial town. It's like everything, everything is frozen in time. It represents decadence, lack of vividness, and especially Charlie's home poverty. Despite the dingy looks, Charlie's home is warm inside, representing the tight family connection. 
On the other hand, yes, the child is home, is Wonka's factory. Coal and jewel on the inside, on the outside, is full of color and wonders in the inside. It defies the physical, um, the spatial and rational rules, a mixture of a world of fantasy and amusement park where everything is possible. However, Wonka uses it as a fortress to isolate himself from the outer world due to the traumatic events in his life. There is a connection between these two worlds thanks to. First, Charlie's mock-ups of Wonka's factory. It is for sale in the future because Wonka's factory is inside Charlie's home and Charlie's home will be on Wonka's factory. And second, the house of Wonka's father. It seems like a product of a dream or a memory. It represents a troubled past, the origin of a trauma, and frozen in time. About the character's aesthetic, Charlie, for example, his clothes, all ones, are shown with the difficult economic circumstances of his family. But they have a hint of color as a symbol of his hope, his faith in the idea that better times will come. Wonka shows a more salient gothic aesthetic, pale and skinny, sober and clothes full of color, and they show one of the resources Martin uses for gothic artists, that is, the clothes show the mood of the character. When Wonka is happy, his colors are, are vivid, but when he is sad or upset, they turn into a darker shade. Regarding Charlie's journeys, um, Charlie's journeys adventure in this case, Charlie goes on a double journey adventure. Firstly, when looking for the golden ticket as he tests his faith and resolve. And when exploring Wonka's factory, it's like an absolute an obstacle race where the children that don't pass the test are punished. Usually physically, according to the actions and personalities in ways only possible in a, in a wonderful world. Then about the journey of self-discovery, again, there's a double journey. Charles tested multiple times about improving his family economic situation, but he refuses every time a history, a history to himself. The moral of the story is that family, their super and love is more important than the money or any material wealth, even more than to be Wonka's heir. And then it's Charlie as a mentor. After being rejected by Charlie, Wonka has a breakdown. He goes to Charlie looking for advice. It's Charlie who helps Wonka to make amendments with his past and to learn the importance of having someone as support. Moving on, Miss Peregrine Home for Peculiar Children. Again, there are two spaces. Jason's real world, it is just like our real world. The Gothic vibes are more visible in the landscape. And the peculiar other world. As in Charlie, the other world has a more vibrant colors and the inhabitants has special abilities that are considered impossible in the real world. Jason's grandfather house, is the connection between these both worlds, as his grandfather Abe is a peculiar himself that had lived in Miss Peregrine's home. About the character's aesthetic, as in Charlie, the character's aesthetic is a reflection of their personality, their peculiarity, and other inner conflicts. The goofiest moment regarding Jason, Jason's appearance is when he is visiting Miss, Grand, Miss Peregrine's home and they make him dress with his grandfather's old clothes. In that moment, he's like a doppelganger because he not only has the same peculiar ability as Abe, but also the same task and within the peculiar world, that is to protect them from the holo ghast. And the peculiars as Wonka have extraordinary abilities and, uh, and an extraordinary appearance. The holo ghast, they're a special kind of peculiar and the predators in the story. As the other characters, they are dressed with an old-fashioned clothes that have monstrous features with white eyes and sharp teeth like fangs that give them a really menacing and inhuman look. About, journeys, about Jason's journey, in this case, both the adventure journey and the journey of self-discovery are intertwined. He witnesses his grandfather's gruesome death. In an attempt to cope with this traumatic event, Jason tries to fulfill his grandfather's last wish before dying, that is, finding Miss Peregrine and the peculiar children in order to protect them. From that moment on, he starts a journey of self-discovery, in which he learns the true past of his family and his hidden powers. It helps him to find his true calling in life and to be part of a world that accepts, that accepts him by who he really is. And now regarding Alice in Wonderland, 
This film adaptation is different from the others because it's an updated revision and spin-off of Lewis Carroll's books, Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, more than a plain adaptation of the books. Surprisingly, in this film, Barton wants to, and the real, Alice's real goal to be as close as possible to our own reality. He uses pastel colors as there is no room for creativity because everyone is acting regarding the social expectations. As in the other films, there is a wall of impossible things. Everything is embedded within an aesthetic that makes vibrant colors with a dark gothic vibes that creates a menacing atmosphere that reflects the conflict the inhabitants of Wonderland are living. Also, it is remarkable the differences among the locations where the actions take place as they are representing or they are reflections of the owner's personality. For example, Red Queen's Palace is based on colors white, black, and red as a deck of cards, and also it's connected to murder and death. On contrary, White Queen Palace is based on the white pieces of a chest, connecting this theme to the topic of Carol's second book, and it symbolizes purity and peace as in the position of her sister. About the character's aesthetic, Alice's Alice appearance, changing size and clothes, is linked to the different stages of her journey of self-discovery. And then there is a great variation of characters in Wonderland, and the only connection between them is the Victorian aesthetic of the clothes as Bertrand tries to connect it to Alice's real world. For example, the Mad Hatter represents manliness in a good way as a synonym of extravagance, but he also represents trauma and loss because he suffered the attack of the Red Queen and he witnesses the death of his friends. That's why his clothes are burned. And the Red Queen represents the grotesque and the trauma as well due to the abnormal size of her head. About Alice's journeys, her adventure journey follows the structure or plot of the classical fairy tale. Alice is going to be officially presented in society and has to confront an unwanted marriage proposition, everything according to social expectations. Trying to get away of the situation, Alice follows a rabbit in a waistcoat down a rabbit hole, and in doing so, she is back into Wonderland. Then Alice, like Jacob Forman, starts a journey of self-discovery in which she becomes a role model for herself and others alike by finding her true self, learning how to make decisions for herself and how you can fulfill your duty without losing yourself in the process. And to conclude, he has said that the role of the Gothic elements in adaptation films for children is to create a visual guideline to the different plot elements so the audience can follow them. These Gothic elements can be identified in certain motifs, themes, and aesthetical strategies from landscape, architecture, and character designs. As the concept of childhood has changed over time, so they do the coming of age experiences. This is more noticeable when filmmakers adapt fiction from previous decades or centuries, as they have to update the references so the audience can understand them and feel a connection with the protagonist. Uh, well, here there are a few references. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia, for the lovely presentation. Very interesting comparison between the different Barton's movies. We are gonna now move on to our last presentation, who's by Ian Downs. He's a doctoral student with Insania at Buffalo's Department of Theatre and dance as an academic and playwright, their research revolves around the performance of horror across media and the audiences and actors of horror. They are particularly interested in the ways in which we use horror as a means of investigating ethical questions, viewing horror as a playful space that allows us to be immersed in a scenario where the stakes can always get higher. And he's gonna share with us their presentation today, Becoming Grey, the Gothic of Morality is told by Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. Thank you, Laura. And I echo my two colleagues here uh, in thanking the panelists uh, for allowing us to be here and allowing this sort of uh, sharing of information to occur across Zoom. Uh, and with no further ado, I have no presentation to share, so you just get to look at me. Oh. <laughs> it would be a missed opportunity, dear listeners, not to warn you of the misfortune that comes from speaking of the Baudelaire orphans and their series of unfortunate events detailed by Lemony Snicket. 
the aesthetic choices that Snicket, the pen name of Daniel Handler, made throughout his series fit deeply into the ideas of the Gothic, a word which here means having to do with bleak landscapes, evil villains, and perhaps worst of all, discussions on morality and philosophy. A series of unfortunate events places a story of growing up as the painful understanding that the world is not always just, that people are not always good, and that things can rarely be seen as simply good or evil. Through the Gothic lens, Snicket's work asks questions about knowledge and ignorance and action and inaction. How might this series offer an ethical perspective to the performative self as it must navigate embodied performances of day-to-day -day actions? As a coming of age story rooted in the Gothic, Snicket offers an exploration of intention and action in the case of ethics, providing for a critical reception to relative morality. In my younger years, Snicket's work was most consistently my brush with the Gothic style, as Goosebumps and other ghostly collections of short stories often delved more into supernatural or weird horror. Similar responses come from Emily Druyard, who views Snicket as one of the central reasons for the rise in Gothic children's literature, as well as Rock Bateur, who commends the series on tailoring the Gothic to fit a young audience's sensibilities. Both recognize Snicket's use of dark themes and sensational language to wrestle with the dark temptations a person may succumb to within a generally accepted framework of Gothic tradition. And while an obvious temptation in the series of unfortunate events might be Olaf's greed for the Baudelaire fortune, the more consistent hurdle for the Baudelaires is the overcoming of ignorance. This battle is one that is the challenge of every single encounter with Count Olaf, with the children having to find a way to outsmart the insidious man while the adults around them are, at best, useless. They are forced to rely on gathering evidence, which is often destroyed under their noses, or trying to find more information about the infamous VFD, whose remaining scraps of knowledge are systematically being eliminated. In setting up his stories in this way, Snicket grapples with a thematic principle that could be best described as the destruction of the archive. The sheer amount of illusion that Snicket uses, much of it admittedly over the head of a young adult reader, allows him to create a world that plays with references, that makes jokes in a very postmodern, tongue-in-cheek way, drawing on a history of Gothic work. His characters reference other authors, artists, and works, such as the optometrist Dr. Georgina Orwell, a pair of triplets, Isadora and Duncan, or the city's sixth most important financial advisor, Esme Squalor. Each of Snicket's books is set in a new location that always finds a way to create feelings of distance, separation, and decay. In her discussion of the way nomadism influences the children's Gothic, Chloe Buckley Germain points out that Snicket imagines nomadism not as a desperate flight from the world, but an empowering mobility. And while her discussion certainly helps to define the movement of the Baudelaires, it seems to ignore the way this mobility is not chosen, but demanded of its participants. The descriptions of caretakers dying or leaving and buildings falling apart, such as their original home turned to ash, Aunt Josephine's home on stilts, which tumbles into the lake below, or the half-finished Heimlich Hospital, which is engulfed in, in fire, all invoke a death knell for the location. They, could, they become places that cannot be returned to. These destructions invoke the weight of the past and history upon the story, as well as the destructive force of time. As much as Snicket creates a world, he actively destroys it. His characters, plots, and places are erased, and their cultural homages are swallowed up by misfortune. So much so that the bleak outlook would be to think of these novels as an erasure of knowledge, Books, libraries, collections, all of which are dissociated, destroyed, or consumed by flames. That would be the bleak outlook that the stories promise their readers, similar to the way that the Library of Alexandria stands as a symbol for the loss of knowledge. But that pessimism ignores two very important ideas. One, that the archive lives on in Snicket's transcription, and two, that the archive is not only created in a legacy of written books or collected artifacts, it is housed inside the living body. It is performance in the same way that Peggy Fallon captures it as it becomes itself through disappearance though complicated as it was by Diana Taylor, who recognized that memories, traditions, and claims to history disappear if performance practices lack the staying power to transmit vital knowledge. 
these performances live on as a repertoire in the embodiment of their actions by the heroes and villains alike in the struggle across the books. Even as the archives are erased, the reminders of actions to be performed continue across. Violet's hair, Klaus's glasses, and Sonny's teeth are recognized as characteristics, and Count Olaf is recognized because of an embodied self, which the orphans are able to recognize, but those that are not familiar with the, with the Count are not. In Laurie Langbauer's discussion of Snicket's use of, use of ethical voice, she gives attention to the way Snicket himself is placed in his text to give voice to a moral ambiguity, to call attention to the book's artifice and contradictions of ethical conduct. And yet, this metafictional journey is only half the reading of these books, because although Langbauer speaks of ethical performance, she approaches the series more in the way it speaks of ethics to children, in the way Snicket advises that in some cases, lying is okay, or that stealing is okay because it is responsive to outside issues. Langbauer, Druyard, and Vader all focus on the metafictional voice that Snicket provides. Druyard focuses on the storytelling that follows Gothic fairy tale structure, teaching a moral lesson through dark themes, and Vader furthers this stance by regarding any Gothic story as central to these themes of moral teachings. But Snicket's moral lesson is wrapped up in stories about actions of terrible men and women doing terrible things to orphans, who in turn do terrible things to stay alive. The moral understanding that Snicket teaches children is the necessity of relativism because there is always more to the story than just a simple dichotomy of right and wrong. There are times, Snicket points out over and over again, that the ends justify the means. But this relativism is corrupted by the series itself, by the archive. As Langbauer concludes, the perception that well-written books are moral books, that the story will save us, remains the naive and romantic belief in these series. The story never saves the Baudelaire's. All these analyses center on the story's voice, the rational, if not overly weepy, voice of Snicket. And that isn't to say that these stories do not teach us the possibility of moral relativism. However, there is more than just Snicket's voice. The story is separate from Snicket's moans and groans and exists in the embodied actions of the Baudelaire children and the way these actions influence their circumstances. This approach via embodiment reflects a critical eye to the value of moral relativism. It contends that any action may have been done with good intentions, but you still chose to perform that particular action. When considering Snicket's undoing of the archive, it is more than just illusionary reference. It challenges the archive by calling out its moral failings and burns it away. All that can remain are the actions and those lucky enough to live through them. The series returns over and over again to this idea of action and the way that action creates meaning. The very beginning of the series starts with a fake performance, and even though it is a performance, it is very nearly a real wedding, despite its overly theatrical nature. The Bad Beginnings Climax presents a significant concern of action and its performative nature, borrowing from Judith Butler's idea of performative as a discursive practice that enacts or produces that which it names. In its framing of the marriage as both a figurative moment and a literal moment, its actors are still very much performing an action. At the same time, they are still actually doing it. This concern haunts the series as the Baudelaire's grapple with a villain who to all but them is a master of disguise and treachery. But it is made clear that the question is raised comes from the middle of the series and the exploration of the actions that the Baudelaire's take. What had become a very simple setup of good versus evil, with the Baudelaire's undoubtedly on the side of good and Count Olaf on the side of evil, is both continuously portrayed while also casting doubt on its portrayal. When the orphans find themselves up against the wall, they turn to the same tricks as Count Olaf and are presented by the media as villainous criminals. This is where the third quarter of the series is most interesting to analyze, and it is also here, unfortunately, that one of my scholars, Bruce Butt, left off his investigation of the series in his, in his analysis of repetition. Uh, in speaking about this idea of repetition, Butt ignores something very significant about the concept of repetition, especially when it comes to the action of the piece. He focuses on the voice, narrowing in on the humor that Snicket provides, likening it to the same joke told over and over again, but unfortunately left off after the Erzatz elevator, which becomes the last book where things follow the cycle to the letter. 
The key to repetition that Bud ignores is what makes any piece of repetition good, how it breaks itself. Butt's proposed cycle is broken by the action of the Baudelaire's. They escape, they escape the village of foul devotees, unaided by Mr. Poe. They become wanted criminals for the murder of Count Olaf, and although they didn't commit the crime, it is their escape from prison and fleeing from the village that make them seem like criminals. They play the role of criminals, and people believe this, while Olaf plays the role of the victim, while getting away with a murder and being pronounced dead because of it. The disruption is a turn towards relativism, but for the orphans, it is a reflection of themselves that makes this important. These actions, because we connect with the Baudelaire's, are all defendable. We can comprehend alongside Snicket why they chose to flee the vile village, why they chose to lie to Hal in the hostile hospital, and why they chose to disguise themselves at Caligari Carnival and help Olaf burn it down. When this part of the series begins, Violet remarks, we know the reasons why Esme, Count Olaf, and all of Count Olaf's associates do such terrible things. It's because they're terrible people. But she is caught in the very grayness that Snicket weaves for the second half. The terrible things the antagonists do define their terribleness, but their terribleness is also what defines their terrible deeds. Their actions are their character and vice versa, which complicates the relationships, which con Oh, ho, 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 which complicates the relationship the Baudelaire's have with their own terrible deeds. Do they do terrible deeds because they too are terrible? The saving grace may be that the Baudelaire's often bring us back towards this critical eye of their own morality. Klaus even quotes the idea from Nietzsche, whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster. And when you look long into an abyss, the abyss looks into you. This tension is important to determining whether the actions are good. And while our Baudelaire orphans are generally able to be kind heroes, the idea of a relative morality is questioned by the framing. Who is actually benefiting from these actions? For the Baudelaire's, their actions are an attempt to save themselves and their friends from Olaf's clutches. But the actions they do in their own defense end up matching Olaf in various moments for the harm they cause. And from the conceptual framework of Elizabeth Gross, who grounds the body as a place of knowing, the Baudelaire's actions are what make them who they are. The context of action is important, but the action is still kept within the body as any action can be. The body possesses knowledge and can repeat that knowledge, becoming a living archive. The actions that the Baudelaire's take throughout the series become embodied behavior, repetitive and alluring, becoming part of their moral character. It is from here that we might turn to a variety of philosophers, Aristotle, Confucius, Nietzsche, and Foucault, to name a few, which identify a core ethical element that is defined by our actions. This moral core is always in a space of negotiation, with so much of the practice of embodiment being concerned about the, cir the circumstances of survival, which would seem to put this idea of embodiment at odds with the challenge to relativism. But as Charlotte Anlin so succinctly describes in her assessment of the value of justice within the series, it is about resisting ignorance. A series of unfortunate events actively tries to persuade a reader through Snicket's voice about the good reasons that the Baudelaire's perform bad actions. But it is the Baudelaire's who always consider those good reasons and question them. In performing these actions, they comprehend that despite their best intentions, they still have done a reprehensible act, a phrase which here means an act that makes one's stomach turn and leaves one lying awake at night. Snicket often postulates about the actions that the Baudelaire's don't perform as the things that keep them up and what they might have done. But the reader, and especially the child reader, the young adult reader, gets to interpret a gray space in that morality that the ends after the fact might not be enough to justify the means, but that sometimes the only way out is through. But to simply act without considering the action puts you in the shoes of any of the adults that simply sat back, did what was comfortable to them, and ignored the pleas of children. They may enter into an ethically gray world, but that does not mean that their actions do not define who they are to other people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian, for that very interesting presentation, questioning the morality in a series of unfortunate events. So we are going to move to our Q&A sessions, and I will 
first thank our panelists for all adjusting very well to the time provided for the presentations. We're doing great. Um, so we already have a question from Monica. Hello. Um, thank you very much, um, all of you, for your presentations. Uh, I rushed to, to be the first one to ask a question because I, I realized there was um, one topic that unites all the presentations, which is morality um, and the moralizing effect of children's literature, as um, Javier said, that really caught my attention. But what I really wanted to ask, maybe uh, it's to Sophia, but maybe you can all uh, develop a little bit on this topic. Um, I wanted to ask you about the Alice in Wonderland's uh, adaptation, um, because what I found in this film uh, is a cause and effect linear narrative, well, a normal narrative, let's say, where uh, Alice has a task, uh, which is to defeat uh, this creature, and it, it's um, and she manages to do that. I don't... Um, it's been a long time since I saw that, but there's like a quest and a climax and this traditional structure. Um, is, is the creature the Jabberwocky? Am I wrong? Yeah. So um, where I was thinking the Jabberwocky in the um, novel, in, in the short, yeah, the novella, uh, is a poem, which is an ode to the absurd, which is the complete opposite. Uh, so I was wondering why, um, a work which is based on absurdism and lack of linearity and lack of um, cause and effect relationships has been turned into that. And I didn't know if morality has to do with that or, uh, well, I'm not expert in children's uh, works and I don't think I listen Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass are children's works, but maybe uh, Tim Burton's uh, adaptation is. So I don't know if you could, could just enlighten me on this uh, more or less in role of children's literature. I don't know, um, Javier, you said that one of, the, that the film was more moralizing or, or the novel. Um, I don't know if you can recap why. Uh, I don't know, I'm just curious in general because I'm certainly no expert on this. So if you could just uh, give me a bit more of information, just taking all this <laughs> disconnected comments that I've made. Well, um, thank you, Monica, for your question, actually, and thank, the, thank you for the rest of the panelists for your contributions, really interesting. Um, what I was trying to convey in my presentation is that um, the interpretation or, or how the audience um, see Coraline's coming of age and the differences, the differences between movie and book is actually, actually changes how we see Coraline, because the movie presents a more naive uh, girl at the beginning, and the change, this change in her model, in her values, in uh, accepting um, the world that surrounds her, and actually realizing that maybe the adults are not actually neglecting her, it's just life, maybe, <laughs> in a sense. So this is clearly seen in the movie, because at the first, she, uh, like we see there's a huge change in the character development. And I think that this morality in children's literature comes, it's when it comes into the picture. However, in the book, she, from the very beginning, she is more smart. She is wiser, she is trickier, she is braver. This adventurous nature that she has is um, highlighted in the book. And um, even though there's a change because she is alone, like all of these values, she has to take them uh, all on, on her own. So, in a sense, it's much more complex. And however, the, um, the coming of age is more subtle because it, re it, it relies on these values rather on the audience actively watching how she has changed. So I don't know if this answers your question. Yes, of course. Thank, Thank you. you. I don't know if Sophia, you could listen to all the questions because your internet connections yeah. are um, weak. Sorry, what a timing. So uh, I think you were saying to me that uh, you were you were asking about why in if with how they were working in the in the novella, and the novella is more like about that madness that everything that nothing makes sense actually, how that they transform in the in the, in the film. 
which was the process of transforming in the in the film that's that was your question isn't it yes yes that was my question and then i was wondering about yeah the moralizing effect i think uh, I, I thought the film is more addressed to children than the novella i think so yeah yeah the the, the novella actually is more about um alice in the development because she is in this uh, point that she's still a child, but she's going to move into adolescence, actually. So she's like, you are too young for certain things, but you are too old for other ones. And you are starting to, um, you are going to be part of society in a more active way because children were regarded, were considered not, not proper, non-humans, but humans in development to say so. And as they, uh, she was going to have more, be more participants in society. And she was uh, expected to behave in a certain way in the book, in the novella. So she was like questioning everything like, Wonderland is actually the representation of the real world, a world of the adult's world, where anything, where everything has its own rules, but you don't know those rules and you have to behave under those rules and you have to um, find the mean, the hidden meaning behind those rules. But when they um, take this topic and they put in the in the film, what they do is, as I said, make a revision. Then the second book of Lewis Carroll actually is uh, stops when she is going to move into into adolescence. And is and now in the film is like she has forgotten who is herself. And in the film, the, the topic of madness as something that doesn't make sense. Um, it doesn't, it actually doesn't make sense in the film because it's about moralizing, but it's about going against social impositions, social expectations. So madness as something that doesn't make sense it didn't go along well with the movie. So they turned more into a madness as extravagance. And that's the Jabberwocky. They transform in the Jabberwocky into a monster. So she's so she has an adventure journey as a, any hero in a fairy tale. That you had to defeat a dragon and you have a magic sword to do it. Um, I don't know if I answered your question or not. <laughs> Yeah, no, that was very interesting uh, review of all the aspects uh, of, of the adaptation and the process of adaptation. Yeah, thank you very much. I don't know if Ian uh, wants to add something. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would be happy to add just a, a small thing that I noticed, and that is um, you you talk about the Jabberwock as, as this poem that is a, an homage to the absurd, and I think I, I agree with you, it absolutely is. It has so many ridiculous words that don't mean anything perhaps, but at the same time, at the core of that poem at least is uh, a narrative of slaying a beast. Uh, the, the, the whole story of that poem is going out into the forest and killing this giant monster with a sword. <laughs> and so that idea of, it, it's still contained within that, uh, the story, that Alice must suddenly become that person that has to take up the sword and fight the monster, even in its absurdity, is uh, is I think still present within the narrative, even if it's very far removed, as Sophia has <laughs> demonstrated. Yeah, well, you you are all right, of course. Uh, the the film um, unfolds uh, this development of the poem in a more visual way, in a more traditional storytelling, filmic storytelling way, but at the core, uh, there are similar things. Uh, it's just uh, one of the paths of adaptation, if I understood correctly. So well, thank you very much. I've learned a lot from your questions. I'm glad uh, all of you had something to say. Uh, thanks again for your presentations and yeah, for answering my question. Thank you, Monica. Thank you all for your answers. Um, since we don't have any more questions for the public so far, I'm going to ask you a question myself. Um, 
Oh, we have one from Paul. Well, I'll, I'll ask my question first. <laughs> anyway, uh, so something that I noticed that all of your, the works that you've chosen have in common, and I guess this is obviously because they are children's work, is that all the books um, or the novels that you've chosen and the movies in which novels they are based have illustrations. And I thought this was very interesting. And I, and I wanted to ask uh, Javier and Sofia how they feel these illustrations have influenced the way the movie has represented this gothic aesthetics and the different aspects and elements that are, well, that how, how you analyze that representation of the gothic and how that connects to the illustrations that inspired maybe the, the visual part of the work. And for Ian also, because the, it also has illustrations, uh, um, maybe how you think those illustrations influence the morality in the sense, and I was thinking how, how ugliness and disability is often connected in the Gothic to, to evilness and how maybe these this children are drawn in a prettier and uglier way and found to laugh, especially it's like, even in the book he's described as being particularly ugly. So how that works in connection to, to the morality you were speaking about. Shall I go first? Yeah, we can go maybe in the in the same okay. order that yeah. thank you for your question, first of all. Um I have actually not had the chance to got to grab the how is it called? The graphic novel. Because I think there I there's a color line uh, graphic novel, but I have just uh, read the book and watched the film. But definitely my version of the book has the illustrations that I have used in my presentation. And I think that they are they function as another essential and fundamental element to the core, uh, to the Gothic core of the story. And uh, there are some scenes in the movie which are just copied and pasted from the illustration onto the screen. And actually, I think that's wonderful. That, that says like a lot from the team and the stop motion animation is just like a wonderful technique. And it even adds more creepiness to the story. You know, you see the illustrations which actually help the readers um, create these uh, other worlds and these Gothic elements in, in our minds. But definitely, I think the illustrations are playing a, a fundamental role here in both for the Gothic and for the understanding of, uh, of the, the story that they want to tell. I don't know if I have answered your question though. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, well, about my PVs, um, actually the illustrations and also the dialogues have a great influence in the movies because they were taken as a base when doing the characters and the scenes designed because um, Tim Burton was, is not only a filmmaker but an illustrator himself. He does um, children's books and also uh, sketching the scenes that he wants to do in the movie are part of the, uh, of the process. So they have, so that's it, that have great uh, influence. And also I want to recommend that everyone that wants to know about how the books, uh, the influence of the original books in the adaptations, just look at the art books of these uh, films because when doing these uh, children's movies, especially when they are from Disney and this kind of producers, they tend to do these artworks uh, these artworks where they explain everything from the moment the conceptualization of the film and such to uh, the end of the producing process. So I recommend to check the them out. And I answered your question. Or? Yeah, that's okay. Thank you for the recommendation, though. I would follow up with the idea as well that. Um, in, in the series of unfortunate events, all of the illustrations uh, echo, I think Sophia had it in her presentation of the long, slender sort of like these ideas that everything is very narrow, very tall, that constantly appears in these illustrations. And I think that that aspect of having to, as a child, look up <laughs> and, and like miss 
important characteristics of things because they are just so much higher um, that you you do sort of you have to cling on to very like immediate understandings of things uh immediate first circumstances of things first circumstances impressions first impressions of things um and i also love the question about the the beauty of the orphan or uh, the ugliness of the villains and i think gothic horror uh any sort of genre has that limitation that has been there for a while and it's rooted in a sort of racist and ableist uh practice that always needs to be recognized um but i think there is something and perhaps it's dismissive argument to some extent that i say this but the idea that the circumstances and the actions that i talk about in that they shape an understanding of a person. So even though uh, Count Olaf is an actor, he is probably rather good looking if he is an actor, but despite that, he is presented as uglier because that is the stuff that the orphans remember. That is the stuff Snicket feels important to uh, notate that these people look a certain way they, they they've been shaped by these cruelties that they've done and so even if uh for example miss bass and mr remora in, in the austere academy even if they look like gorillas they are still not <laughs> they, they are like they could be very pretty people they just have been dulled by the perceptions of what they have done to the orphans um, I think that answers that question. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I think that's that's very complicated as well, because if you associate that doing evil things makes you ugly, then again, that makes it, you know, not, not that, okay, maybe more complicated and ableist, as you said. So I'm, I'm going to give the word to Paul now. I'm sorry for overstepping a bit there. <laughs> No, no, it's, it's, it's fine, Lara. Actually, um, what you were saying there at the end sort of um, does pick up on, on what I was going to talk about myself. Um, I was going to actually ask Javier, first of all, a, a, a question about the graphic novel, but you kind of answered that already, Javier. But I would suggest that you do read it because um, it's A, it's really good, and B, I think it would give you a really interesting segue between the novel and the, and the film. Um, but the question that, that I'd like to ask is just to go back to the question really that Monica asked at the beginning, which is about morality or, or ethics, you know, um, because it's not necessarily something that I fundamentally uh, think about when, when, I, when I think about the Gothic. Um, I'm by no means an expert on, on young adult fiction, but I certainly don't kind of associate the Gothic necessarily with, with, um, with ethical issues. Um, and I was just wondering if, if anybody would have a, a thought about whether you think that a defining aspect of, of young adult Gothic fiction is that morality, that, that what distinguishes it in a way from, um, from more adult Gothic is the fact that it fundamentally does explore um, ethical issues. If you all want to answer, we can do the same thing, go in the same okay. order as we did before. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Paul, for your question. I will definitely, whenever I get the chance, uh, get the graphic novel and take a look because it seems really interesting. And I have actually stepped upon passages and illustrations from the graphic novel, and I really actually have to read it. Anyway, um, in my case, since what I focused on is the coming of age of Caroline, I think it's not that much of a question of morality in young adult uh, literature, but on children's literature, because I, what I know so far is that Coraline is seen as children's literature. And so even if it's Gothic, I, I think I, I, I would argue that we can find moralizing values in the adventure that Coraline goes through in this other world and also in the change that we see in her because for example she is kind of mean to the neighbors and even to Wyvern on the movie but towards the end she has learned that you know it doesn't have to be that way so in, in my case in since Caroline is 
more of a children's book, uh, I would say that it is moral issues are in some way necessary because that is what the didactic purpose is there for, for children to go with Caroline through her adventure and in the end learn about these values. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Javier. So, uh, well, asking you, well, answering your question, I think that morale and any moral topic is at the center, at the core of the children's uh, fiction, because uh, it has to be taken into account that uh, the writers, adults are the writers of those books, so they are conditioned how these um, the topics of them, the gothic topics are going to be received by a younger audience. And also they are educating them. So I think that that's why morale is uh, at the core of these books more than in the in a more selling way than in the adult books because adult gothic fiction is more about um, entertainment. But uh, Children's fiction is more about learning about how society works and how you have to behave in society and what happens to those bad children that don't behave as they have to do so. For example, in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, all the naughty children are punished by Willy Wonka. Um, it's a, they are very cruel punishments. So. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. I mean, just to pick up on, on the, the Alice in Wonderland thing, because I just think following what Laura was mentioning before um, in, in response to Ian's uh, comments, it just seems it's quite interesting that you've got this Red Queen character who's kind of, in terms of her body, is very kind of abnormal and that she's, she's a kind of evil character. And, and I was just wondering what your thoughts are about that presentation of, of such things as bodily difference as being associated with, with kind of you know, negative values and whether you think Tim Burton's work actually tries to address that in any way or whether it just kind of uses that kind of gothic trope in, 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 in a kind of non-thoughtful way, you know, they actually kind of uses it without actually reflecting on, on some of the potential uh, consequences of, of that type of representation. Yeah, usually what happens is that Tim Burton says that no one and nothing is good or evil. It depends on what they do in life or what do they, what do you do or what is given to you. In the case of the Red Queen, what he's saying is that uh, she has a trauma because she felt that all her life people have been laughing to her because of the size of her head. Whereas uh, her sister, the White Queen, is the is a pretty girl and beloved by their fathers and the um, the Red Queen felt that their parents prefer her sister than her. So that's why uh, Tim Burton is saying she's evil because she is traumatized by this, by uh, how people have um, treat her. But for example, other characters in especially Nannies in Wonderland have this grotesque look, but they are not portrayed as evil. So what happens in Tim Burton in every of Tim Burton films is that good and evilness is not connected to the grotesque. It's connected what uh, what people do actually. So okay. I think that answer your question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, thanks very much. Ian, any thoughts on that in terms of the representation in Lemony Snicket? I I always have thoughts, <laughs> um, but I think I think one of the key ideas in terms of morality, at least, is that the Gothic arises from a very European Christianity uh, sort of way of understanding the world, and that always I think lingers in any portrayal of the Gothic because it is whether or not we agree with whether or not we think of these things as good or evil it portrays a clash of vice and virtue typically uh it lingers in people going too far people uh having to be pulled back from the precipice of darkness um and of course all of this language is very coded in ways uh that we we, we just can't escape when it comes to uh this uh white culture that uh 
the Gothic sort of belongs to. And I think to continue this idea, there is the notion that for children, of course, they must be taught morality. There is, there is still a teaching aspect. And I think, of course, the Gothic children's literature is going to have any discussion of a moral or a lesson to be told. But I would, I would argue that any sort of Gothic horror, even like supernatural gore sort of thriller fests uh, are going to have those essences of morality because of where they came from in uh, at least, at least in European and American culture because of this sort of very ingrained idea and understanding that we have of how good and evil should be treated. Um, I cannot speak specifically to other cultures and their rendition of uh, that sort of view and philosophy, because I am not there yet in my PhD program. <laughs> Thanks for your answer. Good luck with your PhD project. Sophia? Yeah, I only want to add that um, it's something about Ian has said, that about that Christian morality. Uh, and I think that people have to take into account that during the Middle Ages, for example, the um, good and evilness was represented so, uh, in a way that is uh, so representing the essence of your soul. So if you were a bad people, you look ugly. And if you were a good people, you look pretty and pretty and such things. And for example, I will recommend the two books of Umberto Eco about this topic, about the um, imaginings of the beauty and ugliness because they are very enlightened. Thank you for that recommendation. So I think we are gonna close our panel here. So again, thank you to all of you for your great presentations and the great discussion now I think at the end. And thank you to our public for being here. And I'm going to ask if they want to or public to shortly turn on their cameras so we can maybe all together give a final thank you to our panelists. And so I'll just thank you so much. And it was, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you for having us. <laughs>